Welcome to 2002 Film Group Review and Thoughts Film. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its link, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movie so watch. So I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. It is intense to hot as I start this recording. Probably will remain soon throughout my recording of this entire vlog. I don't know if I'm too legit to quit. I'll leave that up to you, dear viewers, but I definitely am too stubborn to quit. So I will be recording this entire thing, but I'll probably be talking faster. So I started this video with a review with most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I'll warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can, you can skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger as soon as I end the review itself and get into the thoughts section. Note that the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So content warning and trigger warning. I am going to be discussing potentially triggering content for this movie. Stalking, death threats, murder, and hostage situations. The MPAA rated this an R, and the video will be for those about, yeah, so what is that, Six, 16 years and up, so yeah, the rest of the video will be for that age. This video does not only contain any clips of any kind, the most visual look gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab, I won't mind. I streamed this and thus didn't pay extra to watch it, so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like I'm really wasting my time. Nobody forced me to watch it when I make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, let's so yeah, when I do a um, video on a um, movie that isn't completely new, I try to put myself in the mindset of someone from when it was completely new, experiencing it for the first time. I'm not going to be criticizing this for not being up to the standard set since. You know, it's, it's 19 years old. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I would touch my face, especially now that it's intensely hot. I want to assure you I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. It's also possible that I will wipe my face with a cloth. That cloth is not going near anybody else, don't worry. So I base my I base this video on the original cut. I'm aware that there is a an FX network version which added some stuff back in and some and there's also some censored versions. This video is based on the original cut. I watched this somewhere between, this is at least my second viewing, but it might be my fourth. I'm not 100% certain, but the first time I saw, I, f I first watched it in 2006. And this is one of those movies that the first time I watched it was a number of years ago. I've not been able to watch it many times over the years. It really made a strong impression on me, and I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a long time. You know, in 2006, I wasn't recording videos. And the the yeah if if i had access to this years ago i would already have done this video and yeah so plot 2002 new york city it's a day like any other Stu calls a woman he hopes to sleep with on a payphone so that his wife won't see it on his cell phone bill after they hang up the payphone rings when he answers it picks up the receiver a man on the other end starts threatening him telling him that he has a sniper rifle pointed at him. But Stu doesn't work for the CIA, so this can't be an amnesiac assassin. You'd be surprised. At the time, there was a lot of that going around. No, this is Stu's day of reckoning. The fact that it's personal and there's a chance of redemption for Stu helps really make this movie work. I've seen some say that it doesn't make sense that Stu uses a payphone instead of a cell phone. I completely disagree. It is very clever to write it so that Stu uses the payphone specifically to do something wrong, and that's why the sniper can target him. If he hadn't done something wrong, something that made him feel like he would get caught, if he was using a cell phone, he wouldn't be in a phone booth when the caller calls. And if he was walking and talking, it wouldn't work anywhere near as well. Not for the caller, not for the film. I saw at least one person say that it would make more sense for Stu to have a burner phone. If he used a burner phone and, like, the wrong person got their hands on it, like, a lot of people don't like Stu and would love to blackmail him. Now, now, if you're very young, you might not know what a phone booth is. 
Before cell phones, you could only use landlines, and if you were very far away from a business or home, you know, or if you just can't use their phone, then you could use a phone booth. And, yeah, this has nine taglines. A ringing phone has to be answered. This morning, everything was fine. Your life is on the line. Get it? Because double meaning? Just keep talking. It's now or never. No options, no lies, no fear, no deals. Just keep talking. New York City, 12 million people, 22 million phones, 1 billion connections a day. Today, somebody has his number. Hang up and you die. Now, Yeah, the, the plot is intelligently crafted and well told, and the way it evolves ensures, even if the intensity wouldn't already, that your eyes never drift off the screen. Now, this, according to IMDb, this is a crime thriller. I saw critics say it, it is a near-perfect example of a psychological thriller, right? That's absolutely, yeah, 100%. You know, the it, it is tense most of the movie and there there are some yeah actually yeah I think that is on so this was directed by Joel Schumacher IIP directing a Larry Cohen IIP script and it's you know basically the concept is a Hitchcock thriller set entirely in a phone booth it does have a small supporting cast but all of them are within, within shouting distance of the phone booth it's about karma I should preface the following by saying that I love The Master of Suspense. I think he made some of the best movies ever made, especially the as far as suspense goes. He was... they called him the master for a reason. However, similar to the movie Red Eye, this is a movie that Hitchcock could have made, but the fact that it was made more recently you know, the, the fact that these two movies were made in the early 2000s mean that there is an expectation of what the audience can handle. That is, bigger moves faster, packs in more information in a shorter amount of time than when Hitchcock was making movies. It's also really good that it was made after the 90s, since the 90s were extremely hyper when it came to, to you know, a, a lot of the horror movies and thrillers. In that decade, the new editing techniques really got overused, and some also in the early 2000s, but... This and Red Eye are not examples of that. There's there, there's times in this where, like, Stu is on the phone, the caller is threatening him, and there's someone outside who's also yelling threats at Stu, or, like, they're doing something that's very threatening. And with Hitchcock, it would not have been all of that all at once. It would have moved between them, maybe, but it wouldn't have had all three at once. Now, let's see, the... I don't think this concept has been done, or done better before, at least not with a phone booth, as far as I know. The threat being that if he tries to leave the phone booth, the sniper will shoot him. I don't know any other movie where that's the danger. And I would definitely say it was worth making. So, let's so, I would compare this to Rear Window, which is perfect 10 out of 10. Really, the biggest difference is that in this, Stu is always threatened, where in Rear View, Jeff is the one watching the killer. I suppose you could say that Phone Booth is what Rear Window would be if you did a complete swap of protagonist and antagonist, and Jeff grabbed the rifle. If anyone out there does a killer impersonation of James Stewart, and you and you like you're up for it, I might literally pay money to see this movie with James Stewart voice dubbed in in place of Keeper Sutherland. I think that would be amazing. Not not in not as intense, but very very funny. And, yeah, so, according, you know, IMDb, more like this list, compares this to Panic Room, 7 out of 10. 
also about people trapped in one location, flight plan, buried, those are also 7 out of 10s, and buried is also about people trapped in one location. Actually, yeah, uh, flight, flight plan, you know what, I don't remember for sure, so I, and it's also been compared to swordfish, I guess, as a early 2000s intense thriller that involves yeah I don't know that one's a bit of a stretch anyway swordfish is a one out of ten for me and it's been compared to 8 millimeter which I gave a six out of ten but it's been many years since I watched it I mean that one was also directed by Schumacher I don't know any other real connection there and what's it called SWAT which also stars Colin Farrell so and also in all snipers and since I watched this on Disney Plus the the suggested section compared it to the first Die Hard movie which I gave an 8 out of 10 Transporter 1 which I gave 7 out of 10 Con Air 7 out of 10 and Speed 1 which I gave 6 out of 10 and certainly there are, there are definitely comparisons to be made between Speed and Phone Booth in both, if they don't follow the demands made by the terrorists, the protagonist will die. In Speed, there's also the bus passengers threaten, and for sure a huge chunk of that movie is set in the one location of the bus, but in that one there is the constant threat that they might run someone over or run the bus into a building or something, and the bomb will explode. It's a lot less personal and with a bigger body count. It's also been, yeah, it's, Disney Plus also compares it to Die Hard 4, which... I'm not sure what I did rate that, and Speed 2, which I rated a 1 out of 10. So, you know, a lot of these movies have a protagonist who's the only person who can deal with this terrorist and or their demands, a more or less regular person trapped in extraordinary circumstances, so there's definitely that. And obviously nothing else can really touch the original rear window, but in a number of ways this does come close. And and you know the title. The only special significance it has is that it's set in a phone booth. But it does like immediately, like if you if you just heard there's a movie called Phone Booth, you'd immediately be like, why would they call it Phone Booth? Why why be so specific? You know, and then when you find out that it's set in a phone booth, like if it wasn't called Phone Booth. Let's say it was called, I don't know, In the Sights of the Sniper. Everybody would be calling it the Phone Booth movie. So they, they just, they cut out the middle name and just called it Phone Booth. There are entirely too few great Hitchcockian movies made today, so I think we should appreciate every single one of them. That's why I decided to review this. And the original reason that I... You know, the, the reason I watched it the first time in 2006 was right from when I first heard anything about it, it sounded Hitchcockian. And, it's, yeah, so this fits into the subgenres of psychological manipulation, cat and mouse, hostage, and it's, obviously when you have only one setting, you have to get very creative in order to keep things interesting. I think this movie does a really good job at that. I love the movie. I love the way that the movie gradually builds. It doesn't immediately establish the rifle. At first, the call is just creepy. Because they realize that once Stu is stuck in the phone booth and he knows there's a rifle on him, we know there's a rifle on him, there's only so many different places you can go from there before that starts to just become too tense and claustrophobic and it starts to become like unpleasant to watch in the bad way I mean now this was the script was written by Larry Cohen as far as I remember I haven't watched anything else that he's written but I think I might have to considering that he's written stuff like the Maniac Cop trilogy the It's Alive trilogy the stuff several of these scaredy cats Scaredy Matt from the Scaredy Cats YouTube channel has done videos talking about, and boy do they sound interesting, if not necessarily good. Uh, 
but yeah, the, the writing is magnificent. And yeah, so briefly quoting Wikipedia here. Larry Cohn originally pitched the concept of a film that takes place entirely within a phone booth to Alfred Hitchcock in the 1960s. Hitchcock liked the idea, but he and Cohn were unable to figure out a sufficient plot reason for keeping the film confined to a booth, and hence they never made the idea into a film. It was only after the late 1990s that Cohn revisited the concept again when the idea of the sniper came to him. Cohn solved the puzzle after 30 years of trying. Hitchcock had died, leaving the project in Cohn's hands. Creative Artists Agency signed a contract with Cohen, and the script appealed to a few well-known artists and directors, such as Tom Cruise, Will Smith, Jim Carrey, Michael Keaton, Robin Williams, Anthony Hopkins, Nicolas Cage, and Steven Spielberg. Yeah, so briefly, I, I think Tom Cruise, I'm not sure he could, for, for him to be really, really tense in a movie, I think it needs... He needs to be able to run or jump, do something physical. Will Smith, I mean, he's not that great at playing unappealing characters, and Stu is definitely unappealing. I think there's a chance Jim Carrey could have done it, but I don't... I, th I think the people who think that he couldn't... I think if you watched some of his, like... I think based on his performance in at least some of the number 23, I think there's a chance he could have, have done it. Mel Gibson, maybe. Robin Williams, yeah, see, it doesn't say if all of these are as Stu. I think Robin Williams could have done The Caller based on his performance in Insomnia. I Sorry. Ron Williams, R.I.P., huge fan. I don't think he could have played Stu anywhere near as well as, as Colin Farrell does. And I'm a bigger fan of Robin Williams than I am of Colin Farrell. They're both very talented. Anthony Hopkins, again, I have to assume they're talk they're they're that would be for the caller. He could definitely have done that, yes. Nicolas Cage, I could see in either but he wouldn't be quite as good as either. And yeah, Spielberg could have could have done this as well. One of the most popular and successful film directors and producers, Steven Spielberg, was convinced that if Hitchcock were alive, he would have wanted to direct the movie. Spielberg also mentioned regret in not taking the script. Let's see. The, yeah, so quoting a Quoting fellow Fritzer, the screenplay by Larry Cohen shows the confidence of a writer who knows he has a terrific starting point and plans to squeeze out every last drop of inspiration. Veteran journeyman scripter Larry Cohen, meanwhile, mostly avoids or undercuts cliches, creating dialogue a little too bespoke to be believable, but amusing and angry nonetheless. Let's see, and... Built on an idea so clever that even Joel Schumacher can't entirely botch it. Now... Smartly, the script knows that for the character of Stu and for the audience to buy the idea of the sniper, it's not enough to explain the rules. It's also necessary to prove what the sniper knows and what he can do. So he actually fires a shot extremely early in the movie, and he tells Stu what he's doing at that exact moment. He can recite Stu's personal information. So, you know, it's it's not just this thing of oh, you know, maybe he no no. It's there's there's no real doubt as to what he knows or what he can do, and after that point, then Stu has to try to find a way to keep him from shooting him. And 
this is one of those concepts where it's easy to make the concept scary, but it's like you have to really explain it in order for the audience to accept it. I would say the movie does a, a fine job of explaining. I'm going to try to move the camera just a tiny bit here. There. That's better. Now, let's see. The movie handles the plot twist well. There are not too many. They're not bad. There aren't too few. They're not too easy to figure out for the viewer. You don't need to... It, it's not difficult to keep up with all the twists. You don't need to check Wikipedia afterwards to make sure you've got everything. You don't need to watch the movie more than once to get everything. Though it is... I remember recommending it to other people. I forget if I did watch it with them or I just recommended it and then they watched it and then we talked about it. If, if I watch it with other people, then I must have watched it at least four times, yeah. The, so yeah, the direction is quite focused and uh, Joel, Joel Schumacher. So, the other movies that I have watched directed by Joel Schumacher are the number 23, 6 out of 10, Bad Company, 6 out of 10, 8 millimeter, 6 out of 10. Are you getting a, catching on to a theme here? Batman and Robin, 1 out of 10, A Time to Kill, 7, Batman Forever, 5, and St. Elmo's Fire, 6. So I've watched 8 of the 23 movies that he made. To me, most of his movies are, sure, if that concept sounds appealing to you, and you don't mind the movie being kind of average, it'll scratch the itch. His two Batman movies, I enjoyed when I was a child, but today I don't particularly want to revisit them. It's not news that the twist in the number 23 is ass. I'm not going to shock anyone with that statement. And other than that, if you can somehow ignore the terrible twist, that movie is decently made. Like, the the kind of noir thing it goes for, I, I wouldn't have thought that, that Schumacher... I, I would have thought that his direction would be too busy to establish, like, you can say a lot of different things about noir, but try hard and busy don't really go with it, you know. You could, you could make, like, fast-paced noir, like Sin City and such, but if you're trying very hard, then it's not going to be noir. Noir has a quality of just a, a smoothness to it that it feels like it's just playing out. I haven't watched A Time to Kill in maybe two decades, but from what I remember, I quite liked it. And I'm... I would definitely say I, I wouldn't mind watching it again. It is, it's definitely something that I would be willing to sit down and do. So, yeah, he's most well known for his Batman movies, The Number 23, The Phantom of the Opera, Falling Down, The Lost Boys, if I get my hands on a copy of Falling Down the Lost Boys, I'll watch them. I am not going anywhere near his version of The Phantom of the Opera. It's not, not much of a musical fan to begin with, but I hear his... You know, rather than me trying to explain why his Phantom of the Opera is bad, Lindsay Ellis did a very thorough dissection. Like, she... she Covered everything. So, yeah. Let's see. So, according to some sources, Michael Bay had, you know, like, he, he maybe had, he had like a chance of, of directing it, but Allegedly, he wanted to open the film up from its confined phone booth setting. So he completely didn't get it. Like, why would you even... Like, and if, if I were in his shoes, I'd just be saying, that sounds too claustrophobic for my kind of thing. You know, but just, yeah. Let's see. Meanwhile, the, the racist depictions of the sex workers might be... Th those would probably have been roughly the same if 
if Michael Bay had directed it. Now, according to writer Larry Cohen, the movie was turned into a stage play in Japan in 2009. He never attended a showing because he doesn't understand Japanese, so he wouldn't have understood it anyway. But to his knowledge, it ran successfully for four or five months. I could definitely see that. A stage play would make a lot of sense for the... Yeah. No. All the actors had earpieces and radio mics so they could hear what everyone was doing. And... Yeah. It, it's... You, they got some really great reaction footage out of the, the crowds. And all scenes were shot in order as they appeared, and that really helps. Like, there's a, there's a sense... Like, it's not the kind of thing you usually can do, but if you can do it, it can really help. Like, the, the kind of... Ah, what's the word? You know, it helps the, the focus for for the the characters, for the crew. And quoting fellow critics here, for most of its lean 81 minutes, Phone Booth crackles with the raw energy of a filmmaker on the fringes who has nothing to lose. At the core, a gimmick movie, but if all gimmick movies were as well executed as this, I'd have little reason to complain about them at all. Schumacher tightens the screws for just long enough, 80 minutes, including credits, to provide a bundle of fast thrills. Now, the very first shot is a zoom from outer space to New York, focusing on telephone service. So, you know, it goes, like, there's a, there's a satellite, and it goes down, and, so, yeah. It feels kind of busy and hyper, and... The movie does calm down on those techniques after that, but I feel like, I think the idea was Joel Schumacher wanted us to think about, want, wanted us to see, like, like space, like, it's, it's, it's legitimately impossible for a human mind to fully comprehend how, how much, you know, yeah, the, the amount of, you know, the, the, all the places in space that you could hypothetically, you know, if you had a spaceship that could go far enough before you starve to death, it's, it's insane how, how far you, and, and then zero in on the, the tiny little phone booth, you know, like, there's just, there's room for a person to be standing in there, but beyond that, you know, yeah, and after that shot, we get this, you know, this brief montage giving a sense of what the New York City streets are like. And the the opening also, you get a real good sense of Stu being a douche. Like, you, in, in the first two minutes that he's on screen, you 100% understand what kind of person he is, and how his day usually goes. Excuse me. There we go. That's better. And the ending. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but it fits with what came before. I'm very happy with how the movie ends. I, th I think it's basically the perfect way to end the movie. There's no Deus Ex Machina. There's no other convenient writing. And the, 
yeah, so, you know, obviously the, the camera work is nowhere near as interesting and unique as in Rear Window, but it does do a really great job of the kind of gradual buildup of tension that Hitchcock was known for. Some people feel that the, the camera work is a little bit too much in this, but I, I think it really works well. Now, the characters. The characters are credible and interesting. The acting is top-notch, most notably Sutherland and Farrell. The caller is very memorable and honestly very charismatic. Colin Farrell plays Stuart Stu Shepard, a young, arrogant publicist who becomes a victim of a mysterious caller who threatens to harm him. According to Wikipedia, Jim Carrey was originally cast as Stu Shepard, but he dropped out. Joel Schumacher said, we were going to shoot it that summer, he was fitted for the suit, but I got a call from Jim one night and told me he had cold feet. He really didn't feel comfortable with it. Actors never give up their role. If an actor gives up a part, then it's not right for them. And according to IMDb Trivia, the phone actually worked. And there was someone on the other line talking to Colin Farrell, speaking as the caller, but Kiefer Sutherland's voice was added in during post-production. I think it might have been even better if, it, if they really did have Kiefer Sutherland on the other end of the line, but for sure Colin Farrell's performance was helped by, its, by the fact that it, there really was someone on the other end. Now... From the, yeah, quoting Philip Briggs here, from the moment the camera zooms in on zo Stu, s striding through the streets of Manhattan, making and breaking deals on his cell phone, Farrell is in charge. As celebrity publicist Stu Shepard, the intense kinetic Farrell runs the gamut of emotions. He's like Nicolas Cage in dramatic mode without the scenery chewing. He doesn't have explosions and helicopter shots to take the attention away from him, and Farrell steps up to the chance of expressing his fear, anger, and frustration while acting opposite a disembodied voice. Everybody is his favorite client when he's talking directly to them or about them to someone that can help them. He is legitimately very impressive. Like, love him or hate him, he is good at what he does. No matter who he's talking to on the phone, he knows exactly what to say, how to manipulate them, which makes it all the more compelling when he gets on the phone with this guy who knows everything about him, who has a gun trained on him, and Stu doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know what he wants. The, it's, you know, at first, the only thing the caller tells him is, I know who you are, I could shoot you if I wanted to, I will shoot you if you hang up or if you tell anybody else that there's a sniper aiming at you. At first, he does know and we don't know what does the caller want. And I'm not going to give it away here, but it is definitely, it's very compelling. Kiefer Sutherland plays The Caller, an unnamed mysterious but skilled sniper and killer who calls Stu in the phone booth and starts to threaten his life. And quoting from the critics there, Pharrell brings an emotional readiness to a role of a man who gradually finds himself terrified, humiliated, and exposed. But Kiefer Sutherland, as the voice of the sniper, is equally remarkable. Acting with just one's voice is the same as acting with one's hands, legs, torso, and head tied behind one's back. With his voice alone, Sutherland conveys shades of humor and disgust, but above all, qualities of menace and implacable malice that are chilling. And Roger Ebert, R.I.P., gave the film three stars and said Sutherland's performance, if the voice doesn't work, neither does the movie. It does. And... According to my IMDb trivia, Roger Jackson, who voiced Ghostface in the screen films, was the original choice for the caller. That could definitely also have worked, but I'm glad that it is Sutherland, because at, at the very least, Jackson would have had to do a voice that was very distinctly different. Like, if you hear, if you, if we're watching Phone Booth, and we hear the caller, and we think that's the guy from Scream, then suddenly the movie doesn't work anywhere near as well. You know, it, we, we, it's, 
we, we really shouldn't be thinking of other movies while watching this one. We should be focused intently on this one throughout. And Sutherland's voice does that. I Has he done other voice work that's like really, like that, that people know about? If, if he has, I don't really know about it, you know, and I mean, when I think of Kiefer Sutherland as an actor in general, off the, doesn't he usually play good guys? I feel like most of the things I've seen him play were basically good guys or at least anti-heroes, but not outright villains. So we're not used to hearing him like that. And yeah, so quoting from a picture, the sniper in phone booth doesn't just want want to just kill Stu, he wants to break him. He's kind of like Dr. Phil with a gun, only he's infinitely more personable than the aforementioned bald headed ignoramus. Yes. One of the biggest clues that the sniper is supposed to be a godlike character is the way that Keeper Sutherland's voiceover is mixed. It doesn't sound like it's coming through a phone. Instead, it just sounds like a disembodied, omnipotent voice. This gives the character a more immediate, more threatening quality, and it makes it easier to believe that this is a person who sees everything and hears everything. However, all throughout the film, the sniper gives various false reasons for his behavior, his unhappy childhood, nom, etc. It's a nice little dig at the shallow explanations that are usually provided in such films to justify certain behavior. But even though he says in the film that he's not religious, he'd make an excellent Christian fundamentalist. And I really like, you know, he, he comments on cliches and tropes showing this really important self-awareness for the movie. I, again, like, if we're watching it and we're thinking, oh, you know, I've seen this before, you know, for example, he's a, he's a war veteran that snapped. He's a religious nut. Or, the, you know, we, we've seen so many of these. And... It, it works really well, and I also really like that he's not just going off a script, but he actually very much responds to what Stu, what Stu says. Like, right before the, the whole thing, like, right, yeah, right after Stu picks up the phone and answers the phone, like, almost immediately after, there's this pizza guy right outside who says, the pizza's paid for, and I was told to deliver it to this specific, you know, the phone booth outside this and this. I'm supposed to give it to you. It's paid for, you know. And he, like, swears at the, the pizza guy, and it clearly upsets the pizza guy. And so the pizza guy walks away, and the caller says, you didn't have to talk to him like that. That wasn't nice, you know. And, and... That's just one example. I don't think I'm going to give more examples because I don't want to spoil. But throughout the movie, like, Stu will say something or do something and the caller will actually respond. In a, you know, and sometimes he laughs. Sometimes he says, you shouldn't have done that. And, you know, there, there are various... You never know exactly how he's going to react. That's, that's part of the fun of it, you know. For, for us, not for Stu. And Forrest Whitaker plays Captain Ed Rainey, a police captain who gives assistance to Stu in his conflict, but suspects Stu as... Hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to give that. I'm not sure I'm going to go into that, but yeah, he, he suspects Stu might be doing something wrong. Stu is incredibly lucky that the cop who shows up is not trigger happy. Maybe he doesn't want to put too many holes in him. Maybe he figures that if a black cop shoots a white civilian, there might actually be consequences, unlike when white cops shoot black people. Maybe he figures it's as the song goes. If you see a shooting star, makes no difference who you are. May as well attempt to talk the shooter down. He thinks that Stu has a gun. Kay Jones plays Pamela McFadden, and yeah, Wikipedia lists her as Stu's girlfriend. She wouldn't be calling him that, I don't think. You know, basically, he's telling her that he can get her, you know, he can make her a star. He, you know, she's an aspiring actress, and she doesn't know anyone in New York yet, so, you know. 
I've heard many say that she's not a good actress. I'm not going to comment on that in general. I don't think I've seen her in enough different things to really say. But I do think that this movie doesn't push her outside of her comfort zone. She's convincing throughout her screen time in this movie. And I'm not going to go too much into Rada Mitchell playing Kelly Shepard Stu's wife, other than saying she gives a really great performance. And other than that, yeah, so I will... Ben Foster plays Big Q, and he's, he actually goes uncredited, which is probably because he doesn't actually have a lot of screen time. I hope it's not that he's, like, ashamed of it. He's so much fun. Like... Ben Foster is one of those guys, he's such a good actor, you know, he's such a good actor, he's so un unbelievably talented, and sometimes when you see him in really smart, intelligent, well-made movies, where he gives a really soulful performance, on occasion you're like, I wonder what he would be like if he just had fun with a role, and this is one of the roles where he just kind of has fun with it, and just... Like, he's basically, I'm pretty sure he's supposed to be a parody of Eminem. Not bad. I mean, he's annoying, but I think someone making a parody of Eminem means for him to be annoying. You know, he, he nails, like, the high-pitched voice, the angry, shouty rapping. His performance is so good. It's really too bad there's so little of it. Honestly, they could have built, like, a short film around him. That, that really, yeah. The, like... There's, there's this bit where, like, he's on the phone with Stu, and Stu says, you gotta be reasonable, baby. And he's like, I don't gotta be reasonable, I'm a gangsta. And it's just, like, he nails it. I really, I wish there was more of this performance. I don't think he has more than, like, maybe a minute or two of screen time. And it's just, he's so good. He's, he really nails it. Like, it, yeah, and it, it would be the right time for a parody of Eminem. Because it came out in 2002, which was Ryan, and and it was filmed, actually, if, yeah, because they they apparently like they they, ah, uh, let's see. They they delayed the movie at least a little, but I forget by how much. But yeah, it it would be the exact right time. To Eminem was real big at the time, so yeah, he he, 100 percent just yeah. Over the course of the movie, more people will gather outside the phone booth, which obviously increases the tension. Yeah, I'm just... Okay, so, brief spoiler for the movie. Some of the people who gather outside the phone booth are people very personal to Stu, and people that he doesn't... Yeah, he doesn't want them involved in this situation. No more spoilers for the time being. A lot of people will not empathize with Stu, since he has done some really bad things. But if the character wasn't someone who had done bad things, someone that there's a chance to redeem, like if it was like Ned Flanders in that phone booth, someone who's done nothing wrong to redeem, the man does everything the Bible says, even the stuff that contradicts the other stuff. I don't know what more you could ask. Or if it were a king. Any king, Simpsons, Star Trek, Marvel, any king. Someone who's done things so awful that no matter what they do, we, the viewer, will never consider them truly redeemed. The movie simply wouldn't work. And depending on which review you read, some people hate him, some don't really care, some love him, some dislike him. I think he's he's done he does despicable things, but it's a little hard not to at least admire how good he is at like he he juggles so many phone calls in the first two minutes of his screen time like you just and and it does it's such it feels like you've known him forever within those two minutes you completely understand what he's like and you get this is his day this is what he does all the time he is constantly juggling these favors for different you know, like, he's he's on the phone with Big Q, and he tells him, I don't know if that day is going to work for your big oh, it album release party or whatever. And Big Q is upset, so he hangs up on him. And then he, you know, then he's, he's walking down this New York street, 
And this guy who runs this restaurant comes up to him and says, you really screwed me over here. And then Stu is like, I can get you the biggest rapper, his big album release party, I think on, on the 19th. But you got to come through for me on this one. I'm doing you a huge favor here. Okay, okay. And then when the guy says, thank you, Stu walks off. And I, I don't think he calls himself, but he tells his assistant, call Big Q, tell him the 19th is good. So that's that's his day. He's constantly, you know, figuring out ways to, you know, manipulate these people and get them to do, yeah, you know, get get favors from various people so that it seems like, you know, he's, he's stringing some of these people along. He doesn't really, it's not that he can really do anything for them, but he seems important, you know, in... The ne next time someone talks about, oh, Big Q, he's a big deal. You know who's representing him? Stu Shepard. Wow. Right? You know, and that's what he gets out of it. And in return, yeah, he doesn't do very much for, you know, most of these people's careers. Now, I don't think we're supposed to empathize with him at the start of the movie. But I think, I, I think the idea is that as he becomes more scared and desperate, we start to empathize with him more because we could imagine ourselves being in a situation like that, even if we are better people than he is. The dialogue is really, really good. None of it is white noise. It conveys characterization and exposition really well. It's very quotable and memorable. You know, and I'm to be quote section there are 73 entries and all of them are very memorable so like if I had to guess maybe a third of the dialogue in this movie is in that section and there's a good reason for that it's all really yeah and the movie you know the, the characterization of Stu we, we see how he and actually, not only Stu, also Rainy and, yeah, even so, uh, Caller, the Caller, Sutherland's the actor. You know, we, we see how they change their perception over the course of the, the screen time. Most of them in respond to the Caller and the threat there. But the Caller also, like Stu says, and does some things he didn't expect. Now... Yeah, and I would say something in this movie that really stays with you long after watching is this idea of someone knowing all your dirty secrets and trying to force you to rehabilitate upon threat of death. So the cinematography was handled by the unbelievably talented Matthew Libatique. And I'm just yeah, I'm just I'm just really quickly gonna run through a bunch of movies that he was the director of photography for. Birds of Prey, Venom, Mother, Noah, Cowboys and Aliens, Black Swan, Iron Man 2, Iron Man 1, The Number 23, The Fountain, Inside Man, Never Die Alone, Gothica, Josie and the Pussycats, Requiem for a Dream, and Pi. So he's done some great work for both Aronofsky and John Favreau. Just like, I'm not saying all of these movies are equally well shot, but some, some of this is just... Black Swan is practically cinematography porn. Like, watch that movie and just salivate. Oh, it's it's gorgeously shot. It's one of the most well shot movies I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, and Inside Man also really yeah. Anyway. The, the the this movie does not have handheld. It uses uh, what's it called? Steadicam, but it doesn't use yeah handheld handheld. Now let's see. 
yeah, so everything in the movie happens in real time and, you know, it intercuts things. So, like, there, there are times where you'll see Stu, you know, Stu's face and he's standing there with the phone and he's talking to the caller. And in part of the shot, you'll see Captain Raimi or, you know, so, yeah, someone important to Stu's future. And the, yeah, it, it, it does this really, really well. And, yeah, some really great camera work. Masterful cinematography. And, yeah, so, quoting fellow critics here. Matthew Lubitsch's cinematography is intriguing as he forces certain perspectives based on curious angles and wide shots everywhere. His creative camera work hides the sniper at all times, yet gives you a good feel of the surroundings. I think some of his shakier shots don't hold up as well, but Phone Booth is Phone Booth's in-the-moment visual style works for what Joel Schumacher needs here. Schumacher stacks up his the stylistic tricks, keeping his camera flaggy flicking around the static situation, feeding off the fear of the protagonist. And some call it gimmicky photography. I, yeah, an argument could be made that it's gimmicky. Matthew Lubitsch's cinematography is flashy and dazzling at times, somewhat reminding of, of his in-your-face freestyle work that was brilliantly executed in Darren Aronof Aronofsky's Pie and Requiem for a Dream. He employs a number of low-angle shots on Feral and Phone Booth as if trying to create a feeling equivalent to some kind of street surveillance. Now, the original Rear Window famously doesn't have a single angle, single camera angle, that doesn't originate in the apartment. I'm really glad that they didn't try to do something similar here. At most, you could say that basically the camera is always within range of the sniper. You know, it's it's usually focused on the phone booth. But it's not filmed from only inside the phone booth. That would really not work. And it's not only filmed from ground level. It's not only filmed from above the phone booth. The camera is always reminding us that Stu is trapped in the phone booth. And it, like, it, it, it establishes and maintains this sense that this is a very explosive situation. You know, I, I, I realize I, there's something I haven't mentioned yet. I mentioned the sniper, Stu, Captain Raimi. The, basically, the police think that Stu might be dangerous, so they've cordoned off the area. And there are a bunch of, like, cops and SWAT that are, like, aiming at Stu worried that they're going to need to shoot. The media also shows up and a bunch of like tourists and and such, you know, regular people who want to see what's going on. And you know, obviously the police are going to keep they're not it's not like they can just run up and knock on the phone booth or something. They're they're kept at a bit of a distance by the police, but they are still there. And this sniper, I mean, is there anyone who wouldn't shoot? So, and, and it does really, really well at using that, yeah, all eyes are on Stu. Now, there are a few times where the movie shows something that either isn't happening right now, so a flashback, or is at least showing a different setting. And the movie uses these very well. It's, it's never excessive. And the movie was edited by Mark Stevens III, and he edited the number 23, Freddy vs. Jason, 8mm, Batman Robin, and Batman Forever. So, you know, he he and he, he would work with Schumacher back when Schumacher was alive. You know, what is that? Four times. So that's a... And it's possible they worked together other times. I only looked at the ones that I've watched myself, but the clearly the two of them know what, you know, what's the word? Mark Stevens 
knows what Joel Schumacher wants, and that really helps the movie. Yeah. Now, I already mentioned you see at least one shot fired by the sniper very early on, and instead of making it this big loud thing, the movie very wisely underplays it. And that that is again this thing, like very early on, Stu says, Yeah, brilliant. Go ahead, shoot me. Everyone around will hear the shot, they'll run off screaming, and you'll be caught. And so he shoots, and they, and and you know, Stu gets like really scared but you know snipers using a silencer and you know and and he he laughs at Stu and he says oh let him go let him go when really nobody else realized it and quoting fellow critics here you are never bored for 81 brief minutes thanks to Mark Stevens quickly paced editing and erratic cuts there are some editing and directing flourishes used by Schumacher that took me out of movie because I found them more suited to something like a music video than a movie such as this, which I think could have benefited from a more grounded and less stylized approach. You know, that is the... I don't completely agree. I think that it's used in moderation well enough, but for sure some for some people it will be excessive. Schumacher uses the right angle for every shot and manages to keep everyone's attention with quick pans and abrupt cuts. I enjoy the camp of seeing dated split screens that let you see what the police are doing as we focus in on the booth. The editing makes frequent use of reaction shots to very great effect. A number of the time, a number of times the camera will cut to the cops and SWAT who are aiming their guns at Stu since they think it might be dangerous, and that you know sets up and maintains this tension really well. And it's not a very special effects heavy movie. A little bit of the CGI doesn't hold up all that well, but it's really, like, I already mentioned that the movie opens with this CGI shot. That's the one where it's, uh, after that, the movie doesn't use very many special effects, and all of the special effects after that work really well. This only had a budget of $13 million. It made 98 97.8 million, so it did very, very well. Now, they did some really great production design because this was actually filmed in Los Angeles, and they made it look like New York City. Like, it, you really can't tell. Yeah, that's right. It was shot in November and December of 2000. And then it was delayed, let's see, I think for both 9-11 and there was also this sniper, these sniper attacks. Now, on the, on the costumes, this is directed from Wikipedia. This was costume designer Dan Daniel Orlandi's second feature with Joel Schumacher, having previously worked together on Flawless. According to him, Dolce & Gabbana created the suit and shirt worn by Colin Farrell, Though the fashion house was tasked with making additional suit copies for filming, it unfortunately would not arrive until the last day of shooting. Thankfully, the film was shot chronologically, and thus the costume could sustain damage without slowing down production. Orlandi was able to keep one of the suit copies for himself, as he and Farrell were the same size. That lucky. And let's see. Yeah, the, the movie is incredibly tense and suspenseful. And it uses paranoia, mystery, and psychological horror incredibly well. Let's see. The villain is terrific, and the idea of keeping him hidden like that works excellently. The voice alone, because that's all he is, a voice connected to a sniper rifle, is incredibly effective and scary. And, and that's the thing, like, when, you know, when you watch a horror movie, notice how many, in, in a lot of horror movies, you don't get to see the eyes of the killer. And sometimes you don't even get to see any of the killer for a really long time. And that's because the moment that we see something, we start to try, like, if, you know, if you're watching a horror movie and just something scary happens and you don't see the killer then your mind is going a mile a minute trying to figure out, is he fast, is he big, 
which which direction should I run? All these things. But the moment that you see, like, if you're watching a Friday, you know, you're watching Friday the Thirteenth, and you didn't know that it was Jason, and then you see, oh, it's this this really big guy, and he walks kind of slow. I guess if I ran, I could probably outrun him. You know, I'm not saying that those are still fun movies. But the moment that you know just a little bit of detail, and, and even in those, notice, like, a lot of the time you don't really get a good look at his eyes. Because the moment you see eyes, you're trying to figure out, is is this a threat or isn't it? You know, the moment that you see someone's eyes looking at you, you're trying to figure out, if, if, if it's a scary situation, not, not all the time, all the time, but if it's a scary situation and you catch someone's eyes and they're looking at you, you, you're going to quickly try to, you're going to look at their eyes, you're going to try to deduce, do they want some, you know, do they want to harm me in some way? Do they want to, or do they want to help me? Or neutral? The scenes are easy to follow, they're meant to, and I think that was the right decision. Now, the music was handled by Harry Gregson Williams, and I'm just briefly going to run through the other movies that I've seen that he did the music for. 2012's Total Recall. Cowboys and Aliens, Unstoppable, The Town, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Shrek Forever After, The Taking of Pelham 123, X-Men Origins, Wolverine, Shrek the Third, Number 23, Deja Vu, Kingdom of Heaven, Team America, Wolf Police, Shrek 2, Man on Fire, Shrek 1, Spy Kids, Enemy of the State, Ants, and Smallest Sense of Snow. So yeah, it's a bit of a mixed, like some really good, some, yeah. Anyway, very suspenseful, intense music. Quoting a full critic here. The music is sub Clint Mansell and its edgy soundscape that plays as an undercurrent throughout. It's a good score, and Harry Gregson Williams uses a neat blend of genres and sounds for film with score. I think it feels tense and modern for an additional gripping element to, to film with. And. Let's see. Yeah, and the, the sound design. Since it's stuck in one location, sound is one of the only things that can give weight to things. And it does. Quoting Phil Critic here, Enhanced sound editing bolsters the visuals. Ringing phones are jarring. Bob's quietly booming voice is unsettling. And the sound of a round being chambered is deafening. And this has some black comedy, some blue comedy. Sometimes we laugh with the characters, sometimes we laugh at them. The level of realism is fairly high, like, the the one thing you, where you really need to suspend the disbelief to enjoy it is the realism of the sniper having arranged this situation. The laws of physics apply. There are some fairly contrived situations. Now, yes, so the, the pacing, the movie's tense throughout, and for the critics here, my appreciation extends to the creators who, instead of falling in love with their creation, keep it going only as long as its suspense is sustainable, turning in that rare film that plays under 90 minutes. Ooh. Loud and prancing and filled with all sorts of business. And, yeah, right, there's, there's one critic here who gave it a 50 out of 100 score and said that it should have been a 30 minute short. I can see what they mean. And I do think that, like, if this had been an episode of Twilight Zone or something, that could also have been really compelling. But I am glad it's a movie. The movie is an hour and 15 minutes long without end credits, and only an hour and 22 long with them. It's worth the investment of time. If you're not interested 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. It doesn't feel much longer or shorter than it is. There, you don't have to like fast forward through any parts or um, watch certain parts. I don't wish it was longer or shorter. I think it is the right length. I hope there will be spiritual successors to this, not actual sequels, obviously, but spiritual successors. And I've heard of Cellular, but I, I might watch that at some point, but. I, I don't think it's on Disney Plus right now. If it were, I might watch it. But the yeah, some something very similar to this. Now, as far as diversity goes, 
there are non-white cops and sex workers, but the sex workers are walking cliches. They're practically cartoon characters. And the, the best element of the movie is the tension of Stu threatened with being shot. The worst aspect is sometimes characters will make terrible decisions and doesn't even make sense to the decisions that they make. But, you know, it's, if, if you go into the movie knowing that at some point that's going to happen and, you know, try not to be, try, try not to expect that it'll never happen, then it won't be as frustrating when it happens. I don't think it's a really big deal myself. And some people really don't. Some to some people, the worst part is the the hyper camera work and editing. And it's it's again, you know, if you go into the movie expecting that there will be at least some of that, you know, it'll be less frustrating. And I personally don't think it's a big deal. I was most worried that Schumacher would ruin it with some of his stylistic choices and exceed my expectations. I was most looking forward to the Hitchcockian quality and it exceeded my expectations. And the movie, the movie's entertaining to watch. I don't, it, it, I feel like saying that the movie is draining to watch, draining is too strong of a word, but in that general direction, you know. Now, the movie does leave some unanswered questions. And for sure some people will be very frustrated by that. The trailers don't give away too much. I, I was only able to find one trailer, 2 minutes and 28 seconds, and it gives you a pretty good idea of what the movie's like as well, other than perhaps arguably some of the music choices of the trailer. The cover and poster don't give too much away, and they they give a decent idea of what the movie's like. like one of them is like this close-up of Stu's face like inside the phone booth and like looking out scared and I mean that's a pretty decent way to sum up this movie in one image that also looks good as a poster or cover. The movie doesn't have a lot of metaphors that don't understand elements. It's not hugely deep. There's not a lot of stuff to analyze. You don't need to watch it more than once. And basically, the movie's gimmick shouldn't really work, and the reason it works is the writing and the acting by Farrell and Sutherland. And also, honestly, also the cinematography and editing. Now, let's see. So, they're. I did not find very many YouTube videos when I searched for this. So let's see. There's the there's a Saturday Night Live sketch that's a parody of the movie. There's one that's just called Phone Booth 2002 Movie Review. It's 12 minutes long, which is worth watching. And let's see. yeah, that's. Right, and there's one called How Phone Booth Makes Size Matter. It's 12 and a half minutes long. That's also worth watching. Other than that, I don't know that the... And, and you know, the trailer's pretty good, but other than that, you don't need to watch. Now, this has 72% on the tomato meter and 64% audience... Uh, right, based on 188 reviews and a 64% audience score based on over 250,000 ratings. Consensus is quick pacing and Farrell's performance helped make Phone Booth a tense nail biter. On Metacritic, the critics gave it 56 out of 100, and, or rather, it averages out to a critic score of 56 out of 100. The user score averages out to 8.9 out of 10, and the most, the, the last time I checked, the most recent Metacritic user review was from June 26th of this year. There are 35 critic reviews and 37 user reviews. So, you know, it could be substantially more. There could be much more 
written about it, but yeah, 8.9. They really, really liked it, evidently. On IMDb, it has a 7.0 out of 10. That makes a lot of sense. And there are 674 IMDb user reviews, which is pretty decent for a movie that's this old. You know, the, yeah, and if you go to IMDb's external reviews section, there are 192 links. I got 70 of them to work. And, yeah, and the NBA rating is an R, and I agree. There's not really very much violence. It's more of a threat of violence than actual violence. And when there's violence, it's also not all that graphic. The, like, sexual material is very mild. It's mostly just references. The reason, you know, I, I think the reason that it got the the that it got an R rating is it, there is a lot of strong language like according to the IMDb parents guide there are 143 F words which you know it's not quite South Park bigger longer and uncut but it's still it's that's a lot you know and and this movie is going for substantially more like emotional, like what's the word? Um, more of a more emotional resonance than the South Park movie, which is mainly a comedy. So yeah, that's you know, it's New York. It's Colin Farrell. I I feel like it. It's very realistic. But it is kind of funny that like apparently some Christians really like that the movie has this you know, omnipresent sniper threatening this guy who lies a lot, but they don't like that the the guy who lies a lot swears a lot too. So that's that's just kind of amusing to me. Now, I recommend this movie to fans of Hitchcock who, you know, have also watched a lot of early 2000s movies. If you don't go directly from Hitchcock to this, it'll, it'll be way too... It'll, it'll be exhausting to watch. Don't make this the first early 2000s movie you watch. And there are no special features on Disney+. Plus. I actually, I thought all that there was was a clip and a trailer, but actually if you click the play trailer button, it just shows the clip that it has, so it doesn't even have the trailer on there. Which, you know, for, for like the MCU, there's a ton of stuff, but you know, for stuff that's this old, they don't, they, they sometimes don't have very much, very many extras, but yeah, you know, if you, if you already have it on a different streaming service, then don't bother getting Disney Plus for it, but yeah, depending on what country you're in, in some places it's on, it's on Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Hulu. I recommend reading the reviews of this in particular, but really in general, by Roger Ebert, R.I.P., and Marianne Johansson. And I give this eight hidden snipers threatening you over the phone out of ten. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. Starting with thought section start disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'm trying to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this may be standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes do during this section, once I get into the video, rest of the video itself. With that said, please note that some of the specific discussion of the room may be in this section. I realize it's a video thought, but where I can, don't waste your time. So, yeah, throughout the rest of this, spoilers. I don't think I'm going to be swearing in the video. So, instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I love every line they put in the MVP quote section other than the sex worker ones, as already mentioned, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting there quoting all of them. And, yeah, so, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts, some analysis, some of the jokes. 
The time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is the last while watching. You can watch forward. You can think of it as a warning commentary, live tweeting, and the like. The section after that is the last time before watching. So let's see. Yeah. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean, let's see. I, I don't know if you can. Yeah, you can't really call. Yeah, the, the, you can't really refer to the two previous victims of the sniper, of the caller. You can't call them characters because we basically know nothing about them. Obviously, they don't deserve empathy. But Stu and the caller are probably the least likable characters in the movie as such. And I would say the movie does have empathy for both of them. And I think that was the right choice. My making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad or me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to emphasize the and overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to the section. Notes taken while watching. It is undeniably satisfying seeing Stu not be able to get what he wants out of Pam right after we've seen him manipulate people and taking off his wedding ring right before he called her. I like that Stu attempts to star 69 the caller. Of course, for the movie to work, that's not going to work for him, but if he didn't try, people in the audience would be yelling at the screen. I like the caller making fun of the reasons why he would be stalking a Stewart, and I like when when the caller calls Pam and tells her Stewart lies and things like this. You know when he's right before he hangs up, he says goodbye, big kiss, so creepy that he says that back to Pam. That means that he heard her say that to Stu. The laser dot the does the kind of ridiculous. I don't I don't know what happened there. I don't know why they didn't just get a an actual like laser pointer dot and and use I don't know. I already mentioned that the sex workers are cartoonish, but for sure the movie uses them to increase the tension well. First is one of them, then she brought a friend, and then a third one comes over by herself. And then Leon comes over and all three girls are there. So, you know, they, they do a good job of gradually, you know, a lesser movie, a movie that didn't understand Hitchcock and his idea of raising suspense gradually would have just had Leon show up immediately or have all of the girls there. I bet Michael Bay would have had all the girls there at once, for example. I think the movie does a decent job of getting to a point where Stu says yes and the caller takes it as yes, do shoot Leon. The tension has increased. The caller is literally saying, if he gets you out of the phone booth, I will count it as a hang up. I will shoot you. And the movie did need for someone to get shot even this early on. Otherwise, it just wouldn't... You know, you can only do so much to keep the, the tension going if it's literally just one guy in a phone booth, one guy on the other end of the line with a sniper. You know, you have to have something more. And I can understand those who say that it's frustrating watching. We know that Stu didn't shoot anyone, but, you know, these people are saying that he did. And he, they saw a gun and all this stuff, but... It... The... the the movie needed something like that. And I, I don't think that it's excessive. Really chilling when the caller reveals that he can hear everything said inside the booth. He picked up the cell phone call. And right after Raimi arrives, he says, suicide by cop will not happen on his watch. And the caller points to the cameras, you know, says, oh, the, 
they they're hoping that the cops will shoot you so that they can sell the the tape so we can accept that he he isn't going to get shot right away by the cops but there is still the tension there the caller well calls Stu on supposed connections that Stu has talking about the press really really great I'm, I'm not gonna claim that you know some people have said that they thought that Stu deserved what he you know what he experiences I, I certainly don't think that you can make a strong arm if, if the caller ever really did would have shot Pam or Kelly they didn't do anything wrong. Pam thought he wasn't married. Kelly had no idea what was going on. You know, I don't think you deserve to be shot for the things that we know that Stu did. I do think it makes, you know, one of the guys he shot was a pedophile. I don't really have any, yeah. And then there was that stockbroker guy. I don't think you should shoot people like that in real life, but you know, I can understand the, the appeal of the, the... I think in real life you should just take everything they have. They should, they should have so little to live off that they would... that they end up hoping that they hadn't made it so difficult to survive if you had very little money. That's what I think. I don't think you should do any violence towards them in real life. Anyway... Or Minecraft. But anyway, the... the yeah, so the the other thing. Right. I don't think that you should shoot someone like Stu for you know, for, for the things that were told that he done he did he did in you know, in real life. But I do think it is very satisfying to see you know, Stu be called on you know, he like Stu's like, oh, I can I can get you like big news people down here, and and you know maybe that would be you you'd rather talk to like big deal news people than than shoot me, wouldn't you? And then the caller's like, ah, oh, who could you get like Larry King, Diane Sawyer, ah, oh, that would be man, you know he's he's saying I know you can't get me any of these people, you know it's just it's satisfying to see him be called on those lies even though in this given situation it does also involve a sniper rifle, but just, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. I think, I think it's very entertaining as a movie concept, but I wouldn't want anyone to do it in real life. I really appreciate that the movie does give reasons for why the police, uh, Right, what the the police don't like try to forcefully remove Stu and and you know stuff and that you know he says he's talking to a psychiatrist and one of the cops points out if he actually is talking to a psychiatrist we're not allowed to listen in that would be a breach of his civil liberties I think you know president doctor patient president. Holy crap, it is it is so hot my brain is melting. Patient doctor patient confidentiality. But they can trace the number. You know, that's that's a good clever cause the movie doesn't work anywhere near as well if the police can hear what the caller is telling Stu. I really like that Stu does try everything to solve the problem. He tries threatening. He pretends that the caller has the wrong person. He makes him some offers. He tries to empathize with him. All of these different things. Again, in part so that the audience isn't frustrated that he doesn't try these things. And it's also very realistic. He behaves exactly the way that he would in that situation. I'm not saying everybody would behave exactly like he does. But his character, based on what we knew before he picked up the phone for, from the caller, yeah. I, you know, Rain and this other guy are arguing about, you know, you, you, you have to let a professional handle this. Well, until a professional arrives, I'll handle it. It's pretty funny. 
I can't tell if the audience is supposed to agree or be disgusted by the sexism of the caller when he talks about looking at Kelly for makeup and such. You know, certainly some of the things he says where we, the viewer, not Stu, obviously, are supposed to think that, you know, the caller is just telling it like it is, being, yeah. And Stu temporarily goes quiet and even hangs up and tries to give himself up, but it just doesn't work. Very clever that the caller stashed the gun in there and the caller threatens that he'll shoot Pam if Stu doesn't take down the gun. You get to choose Pamela or Kelly. Obviously, I'm not saying this is equivalent, but he is basically saying if you really cared about Kelly, you wouldn't consider cheating on her. If you really cared about Pam, you wouldn't be trying to trick her into having sex with you. You know, so, so he's basically saying clearly one of them means more to you than the other one does, so which one is it? And Raimi points out the caller didn't prevent the tracing of the number. It might not have prevented the tracing of the number when they called Kelly at the store, and that works out. And I mean, that almost... I guess it is just that the caller made a mistake there, and he was ready for... Well, no, because he's got his own sniper rifle there at the end. I guess he left that so that... Yeah. And... And yeah, Ra Raimi finds out, you know, now that he knows about the sniper, he tries to get Stu to trust him so they can resolve on the situation. And he goes, we're working on getting to your lawyer. I got the number from Kelly. I've got my best man working on bringing him down. Not exactly the most subtle, but there's a little subtlety there, yeah. And Stu giving a public confession is very compelling. I'm... I'm not ultimately going to make a judgment call on, like, I think it's the kind of thing that I wouldn't want to watch it outside of fiction. And I only want to see it inside of fiction in very limited circumstances. But I do understand the appeal. You know, some people feel that it's, that's the, that is the way you should you know, atone for your sins. You should have to confess to your sins in front of the world. But, you know, no matter how you feel about the, like, the morals of it or ethic issues, Colin Farrell gives a really solid performance, and the, the writing is great. And, yeah, seems like they were able to trace the call very tense. I mean, I guess in reality it's supposed to be that the caller set up that other place. Yeah. I like that at first we don't know who it is that shoots Stu, you know, and like we kind of assume that it must be the, the caller. And it is a relief to see that Stu was only hit by a rubber bullet. I personally, you know, I would like to hope that Stu will continue to be, you know, a better person after the events of this movie. But I definitely go, I, I think it would be too much if the movie ended with him being shot and killed intentionally by the caller. I, I don't think that would completely... I, f I feel like the, the confession was what the caller wanted. He wanted him to, like, basically, after this, Stu is never going to be able to convince someone He's never going to be able to lie to someone about the, the, you know, stuff that he does as a publicist. I, you know, honestly, he might have to find a completely different job. I, I do like that, you know, he says, I should be president. That's, yeah. Funny. Funny because it's true. Now. But, but yeah, you know... The, the movie ending does kind of need for Stu to be shot, even if only by a rubber bullet. And it does, yeah, like, if, if the caller just said, that was exactly what I wanted, goodbye, and hung up, 
that would be a bit of a, a it would be too small you know you need something at least a little bit bigger now the way I figure it the caller is certain that Stu is so heavily sedated that he can't do anything about the caller right then and there and when he you know when, when he there at the end when he shows himself to Stu yes Stu will be able to give an accurate description of what he looks like later but by then the caller will be long gone Maybe he'll leave the city or something. Like, if he leaves, maybe maybe the city isn't enough. Maybe if he leaves the state, then, unless you get the FBI involved, they can't go after him. You know, maybe he'll leave the country. Or, you know, maybe he'll go somewhere else for, for yeah, for, for other targets or something. Now, the... I have to admit, I had actually forgotten that we saw his face. I remembered it. I remembered that he talked to Stu there at the end, but I remembered it as us not seeing his face. I remembered it as just being like a vague shape, you know, because the, you know, he, he gets this, I don't know, morphine or something, and he's like, he's, he's, it's starting to take effect and stuff is getting blurry. I remembered him as just being a blur. Now, others have already pointed out that the bag that the caller is carrying clearly looks like there's a rifle in it. Like, it could hold a rifle. The cops would obviously have stopped him. I think it should just have been that he left the rifle in the room, which it looked like he did anyway. I mean, he could just wipe off the prints and remove the registration number, and suddenly them having a gun doesn't matter that much. It is absolutely perfect that the movie ends with someone else picking up a phone in a phone booth. The caller is going to continue his work, and it's not going to be that same phone booth. A, it's a crime scene. Two, the the we were told earlier that you know they're actually the very next day the company is going to remove the phone booth entirely. The end credits feature outtakes of the various actors, something I usually like in movies. This is no exception. And that brings us to the final section entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. I think it is absolutely perfect that you only see the caller at the very end and otherwise only ever hear him. And at the end of the film, he's still out there forcing sinners to repent. I like that the caller pretends that he doesn't pick up on Stu trying to get a hidden message through the 911 operator. As soon as it's properly failed, he revealed to Stu that he was aware that he's toying with him throughout the movie. I appreciate that after so much of the movie is Stu at the caller's mercy, doing what he's told out of fear, the confession is because he does legitimately feel bad. He does know that Kelly deserves better. You know, he, he said, like, the... the um, Yes, I, I, Stu tells the caller, I know, it doesn't matter if I give a confession, you're going to shoot me anyway. And then the caller asks, then why did you confess? And he says, I didn't do it for you. I'm not saying that the following is my reading of what the movie is supposed to be about, but I can't help but note that the effect that the caller has on Stu is like the effect that anxiety and a guilty conscience can have on a person. It renders him immobile, he can't communicate openly with people around him, even people close to him, who find him and his behavior to be unacceptable to the point where some of them get violent in order to get him to stop behaving the way that he is. Now, WatchMojo says that the fact of the pizza guy wasn't the real sniper or was a twist everyone saw coming, I really don't think it's supposed to be a twist. I think it's just there to throw the police off. I don't think anybody in the audience is supposed to actually believe it, and definitely no one does. I can't even imagine. How, how could anyone possibly believe? No. Let's see. When Raimi tries to reason with Stu, the caller makes him insult him. Stu usually does insult the people around him, but he's rarely around people who can have such a profoundly negative impact on his life. So he doesn't want to be insulting him. So that's a really great, like, what's the word? Yeah, you know, it, it makes sense as a, 
it's again, it's the you know, he's he's making Stu do the things that Stu already does, but just in situations where he normally would. Now, let's see. So yeah, the IMDb goofs, again, I try not to argue with them, but occasionally. For this movie, it lists as a plot hole that Stu's reason for using a, so a phone booth to speak to Pamela doesn't quite hold up. His wife may check his cell phone logs, but it's perfectly legitimate for a publicist to be speaking regularly with a client. The way I see it, he, Stu imagines that if, like, maybe at some point his wife will just be too, like, suspicious of him, and she'll check the call logs, and she'll start calling every, every female name that, well, I guess, would that be on the log? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe just call every single number and say, this is Stu's wife. And if, if she called Pamela and said, this is Stu's wife, then both of them suddenly know, and that's what he's trying to avoid. I, I don't think that it's... I agree that, you know, a publicist, sure, but Stu, I, I wouldn't let Stu call just anyone if I had, if I had a personal relationship with him I would also be very worried about what what is he saying to people? What what kinds of things is he, you know? And yeah, so IMDb trivia. The original ending was that Stu would step out of the phone booth and start firing up at the windows. Then after Stu lets off two shots, the rubber bullet from one of the snipers hits him and he goes down. Raimi steps into the phone booth to get the receiver and hears the SWAT team come in the door and wound the voice. The script ends when Raimi wants a final statement from the voice, and he says, directing to Stu, but you'll never forget me. I gave you the most thrilling day of your life. Say thanks, and then he dies. I am really, really glad that they didn't go with that. I, I, it's hard for me to put into words how unsatisfying of an ending it would be if the caller ended, yeah, died at the end. Yeah. The scene where Stu confesses everything was shot in the first take. Colin Farrell got applause from those present right after the scene was shot. The phone booth can be seen as a confession booth, and the sniper is either a priest or God to whom Stu is confessing his sins. In the end, he's absolved. According to Keeper Southern, Colin Farrell's tears during the confession scene were real. Farrell, who suffers from crumb my brain is melting again. Chronic insomnia was not able to sleep the night prior, and he was crying at the mere concept of shooting all day. Luckily for him, he nailed it on the first take, so much so the crew applauded and rapped. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't have very many lines in the phone booth itself after he, once he's done confessing, then, yeah, so, so there wasn't much left to shoot. And, and the only thing after that is just him lying there. That wouldn't, that probably, although, you know, also looking like, oh crap, I gotta, I gotta keep from, from going under now. I gotta tell someone the sniper's right there. None of the extras were given instructions on what was happening, just that they should react accordingly. All of their reactions to shots being fired and Stu's confession are genuine. That was exactly the right way to go. Like, that's... holy crap. Yeah. It's, it's perfect. Extras hadn't read the script, so most of their reactions are genuine. When Stu is being told to hang up the effing phone by the prostitute played by Paula J. Parker, she calls him the N-word. This was ad-lib, so the who do you think you are talking to look that Colin Farrell gives her after she says it is genuine. That's perfect, because that is exactly how Stu would react. Like, 
it wouldn't work if he was playing like this really humble guy. But that you know, it's how Colin Farrell actually reacted, and it's how Stu would react to that exact. That's yeah. Yeah, so quoting fellow critics here. Hitchcock and Kafka meet in Times Square via Larry Cohen. I actually found it darkly funny, even Kafkaesque, that the Cohen's reasons for terrorizing Eric and Mary P.R. Flax do, including his included his aspiring to lure actress client Pam, the ever appealing Katie Holmes, into an affair. Think about it. The Kohler was so twistedly self-righteous and judgmental that he was punishing his victims, assumingly, for thought crimes. How big brother can you get? And... I don't really agree with the following, but I do think it is worth. It's it's a it's a decent point. I I don't I I respect that point of view. I don't agree with it, but I respect the point of view. The killer on the phone thing has, of course, been done before. From when a stranger calls from the line of fire to scream. Okay, so far I agree. In phone booth, the caller's too generic to be very creepy or even interesting in his own right. He's got a shtick. Like the killer in Seven, he's out to punish the wicked, and a mocking sense of humor, but none of the personality that John Malkovich had in the line of fire. Okay, fair point. He's too invulnerable, too unshakable, even Hannibal Lecter could be thrown off balance more easily than this guy, nor does the film even gesture in the direction of a motive. It doesn't help that the voice doesn't sound like a voice on the phone, but like a studio recorded celebrity voiceover. Nor does Sutherland's velvety note perfect delivery improve matters. See, I can I can see what he means about you know even even Hannibal kind of Lecter, but I think it's perfect that we don't know the motive. That literally, I essentially he's less a character in the movie. The caller is he's more of like a divine presence. And, and actually, the only time when Stu sees him, maybe he doesn't actually see him. Maybe he's not even there. It's just that Stu is going under and his thoughts are still of the caller. You know, we don't see anybody else see the caller. So, I just I just think that you got to read it from that perspective. Like, if, if you don't think that's a good way to handle it, that's fine. But I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say that the movie is wrong for taking that approach. It, it's not... Like, yeah, the film doesn't even gesture in the direction of motive. There's not supposed to be a motive. That's that's part of the idea. And the velvety note perfect delivery is especially perfect for if it is like a divine presence. You know, I'm I'm not telling anybody what to believe as far as religion goes, but I do think that this is a movie where either you kind of buy into the, the sort of notion of this religious, you know, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, you know, either you buy into it and the movie works, or you don't buy into it, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say that it's bad about the movie, that it, yeah, I think I've made my point. And that was all that I had to say, except, of course, for my sign-off. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe. There should be a link to my main channel page and one, two, or, yeah, one, two, or more links to relevant playlists on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, and currently they tend to come out very similar to this one, so if you want more like this, you're in luck. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.